are featured BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders for this episode are Operation Homefront, Partners of the Americas, and Remote Area Medical. To find out more about these and other BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders, go to give.org. You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. You know, a lot has been said about the media. And most of us think about the media in terms of, you know, how we get our news and sources of information that we use every day to make decisions. In the nonprofit sector, we also depend on media coverage. Many nonprofits don't have big budgets for advertising and promotion. And so we rely heavily on stories that we can tell about the work that we do that drive support and interest in that work. Well, some of us have wondered from time to time if that coverage could be sharper, if it could more accurately reflect what's going on in the nonprofit sector. We see lots of stories about scandals and scams that may exist in the nonprofit sector. And we we are hopeful that at some point that coverage could be actually a bit more balanced. Almost anything you think of can have a a story that's part of a charity angle. And we are always hopeful that we can get to a point where the media begins to pick up on that. But today we brought with us someone who knows a lot about this, someone who's actually worked in the nonprofit media, if you would, for the last several decades. And she is Stacey Palmer, who is the chief executive officer of the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And Stacey helped found the Chronicle in 1988 as a top editor. She serves as the organization's editorial leader for now more than two decades and has overseen its transition into an independent nonprofit that spun off from the Chronicle of Higher Education back in 2023. So we want to talk about that as well. And Stacy obviously appears frequently in other news media to offer and provide commentary on events and news around the social sector. And she was a key player in organizing the Chronicle's partnership with the Associated Press. And I'm happy to be a part of that as well. And we're going to talk about that partnership and what it intends to do. She also authored um, or edited, I should say, Challenges for Philanthropy and Nonprofits. And this is a book published by the University Press of New England, and it actually collects three decades of observations by our friend, now deceased, the late great Pablo Eisenberg, who was also a Chronicle columnist. As I mentioned, Stacy worked for the Chronicle of Higher Education before she joined the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And we're so happy to have her with us now. Stacy, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Art, right, thanks for having me and for the, all you and your colleagues do for the sector. It's such important work. So, Stacy, let me ask you. You know, usually people who are in the media have this story. They grew up when they were kids. They were reading everything in front of them and they were just fascinated by the written word. And suddenly they decide in their lives that they want to be journalists. What's your story? Is it anything linked to that? Sort of. 
I grew up in the Watergate era and I watched Woodward and Bernstein do all of the things that they did. And I said, I want to do that. So I came to Washington <laughs> as a journalist, um, didn't get a chance to do exactly that, but have very much gotten to live out the dream of holding people accountable and making things happen. And it's a wonderful window as a journalist. It's kind of amazing all of the things that you get to witness, be a part of, learn about. And that's why I love covering philanthropy is there are so many topics that you quickly become an expert on. One day you need to know what's going on with climate change. The next day you need to understand religion and then you need to understand education. It's it's every subject imaginable. No, that's very true. And I keep telling the media, you know, you all are looking for stories. There's a story about philanthropy or giving or nonprofits in almost every story you write, you can think of. You, there's always an angle that goes back to a nonprofit because Nonprofits are doing the work in just about every area where there's any kind of need, challenge or controversy. So they should begin thinking about that. And I know you've worked a lot to try to get that that understanding into your media colleagues. How's that going? One of the reasons we decided to become a nonprofit is that we really wanted to expand our mission to focus on helping local journalists in particular do a better job of covering nonprofits. And we are now in the process of working with eight organizations around the country to help them learn. They spend a year working on stories about nonprofits in their communities. And our goal is to show them that there's deep coverage, it's important coverage, and we hope that readers pay great attention to it. We also have a partnership with the Associated Press, as you mentioned, that we work on so that our stories appear on their feed. So all around the country and really all around the world, you can read a lot more about philanthropy now than you ever could before. So, you know, that's been, and AP itself has added two reporters to the beat. So that's a tremendous influx of reporting in a field that has been woefully undercovered. Yeah. I remember the days when I started the Wise Giving Alliance where almost every newspaper had sort of a nonprofit desk. You know, we had one at the New York Times. We had one at the Post. Even uh, USA Today had something that you could go to. And you guys were all competing to get the best stories. And uh, I guess those were the heydays. But we've seen a lot of change in, in this field uh, what are some of the major changes that sort of led to the abandonment almost of coverage of nonprofits? I think it's really the problem that the media itself is facing. It's not particularly about nonprofits, but about the challenges that the news industry has in financing its work. And so let me start with the good headline, which is a lot of nonprofit news organizations are springing up and covering issues that matter to nonprofits. So while you don't see coverage necessarily in the big mainstream papers, you know, you have things like the Marshall Project covering criminal justice, Chalkbeat covering education, more and more of these organizations, and many of them are community-based. And philanthropy itself is playing a very big role in financing some of these organizations. So I think the problem is not solved by any means, but we are seeing a big change in the media industry. And hopefully, as we have these new nonprofits developing, they will make nonprofit coverage part of their beats because it, the, the subjects that they're covering, they're going to find it impossible to do a good job without talking to the nonprofits in their communities. At least that's my view. And so we see this as a tremendous moment where we hope there's an inflection point to change the thinking about why nonprofits are worth covering. They're worth covering because, of course, one out of every 11 Americans works for one. And it's astonishing that we don't think about that as a coverage area. How many reporters are assigned to cover various industries? You would never, ever see some news organization abandoning that. So it's sort of silly to see that they don't pay attention to nonprofits. But what's really important is nonprofits are doing the work to solve problems in their communities around the world and around the globe. Those are the stories that readers want to read about. And so as journalists, when we say, oh my goodness, we've lost readers, people don't want to hear about all the awful news. And there's there's a term journalists often use, it's called news avoidance, that people are just tuning out because there's too much difficult news to absorb. Well, we can solve that problem by talking about all of the things that nonprofits are doing to make a difference. And that's not you know, saying we have to have Pollyanna stories in any means. Nonprofits are dealing with some of the toughest problems there are. They often identify where problems are coming. 
they're always five to 10 years ahead of where the rest of the world is in terms of thinking about things. So we'll do better journalism if we cover nonprofits. I completely agree. I was just thinking about Nancy Brown, who was on the show last week, the CEO of the American Heart Association. And when DeMar Hamlin had his incident, his cardiac arrest on the football field, you know, people in the American Heart Association observed that this is an opportunity now to teach people how to do CPR. You know, what a great story that is. And, you know, you take something that was a near tragedy, which I'm sure, which was widely covered in the media. And then you pick up from that some of the great things that can come from it. It seems to me that sort of rounds out our understanding and it helps us appreciate that we have agency. And why wouldn't we want to cover something like that, you know? Exactly. And and that connection that we should help, you know, readers, viewers, listeners all feel through news coverage, I think that's absolutely essential. So I think the more of that we can have, that's a great example. Well, you mentioned uh, a statistic about 11% of the population, the working population works in the nonprofit sector. And it reminds me of an event we did yesterday where we were doing a webinar together uh, covering some new data issued by the, the Lilly School at the Indiana University. And one of the statistics that sort of blew us all away was that only 5.4% of the American public would say when asked that they had a service uh, provided to them by a nonprofit organization. If that statistic alone doesn't tell us that we need more coverage, <laughs> then I don't know what a statistic would be. But what, what would you say could be some of the reasons why we have such a low appreciation for what we're getting from nonprofit organizations? Yeah. One of the things that nonprofits don't have the ability to invest in as much as I wish they could is telling their own stories. And, you know, they're so busy providing services, taking care of things, doing advocacy work, all the things that we want them to do, that they don't have a lot of time to really talk about who they are and what they do. And there's also not a lot of connectedness. You know, how does the arts organization in town work with the food bank? You know, do they have any connections? Do they say we are all part of this world of voluntary organizations? that are committed to advancing the common good. You don't hear much talk about that. And so I think as a result, people don't necessarily know that all of these organizations do have something in common. The kinds of people who work for them have skills in which they have really become professionalized in how to serve the American people and really, you know, to do international work as well. So I think, unfortunately, none of those stories get told often enough, and that's why people don't identify. And unfortunately, too, sometimes people see that they're only being asked to make a donation rather than contribute in other ways. So in some ways, nonprofits themselves can be part of the problem by constantly talking about appeals and asking for money rather than talking about, here's what we did. Here's what we accomplished. Here's the outcomes. That's what I think the press should be covering more of. But I think it's also what nonprofits have to be talking about. You can't assume that people know what it is that nonprofit organizations are actually doing so that the more we can tell those stories, the better it would be. If I had a magic wand, I would really ask some billionaire to give some money to the storytelling capacity of nonprofits, because I think that would just make an enormous enormous difference to help people connect and find ways to get involved in whatever way. It's not just donations, it's volunteering. There's so many things we can all gather to do to help nonprofits advance their cause. And yet we don't ask for it nearly enough. Volunteering rates aren't as high as they should be either. So it's not just the number of people who don't know about nonprofits, but it's those who choose not to get involved. And astonishingly, the rate of Americans who give to charity has dropped in just huge amounts over the past two decades. And I know you've been very involved in work on that front. Yeah, yeah we're working on it through the Generosity Commission, which is set up to try to figure out what's going on and why. But you know, I, I think about this statistic, this 5.4%, whatever it is. And I wonder if some of that has to do with the other statistic, which is the declining number of people giving, which you mentioned, and volunteering. 
and whether people view nonprofits more like for profit entities. In other words, everything is an exchange and we do have to sort of contribute something in many cases to some of the key nonprofits like hospitals. You know, we we pay our hospital bill, even if it's a nonprofit hospital generally. We pay for our higher education or, you know, we pay for tickets to social events and and to operas or music events that museums and other uh, venues that we go to that are nonprofit. Maybe we don't think of them as nonprofits because we're actually paying something for that. And as we know, many nonprofits have had to develop different types of revenue streams in order to uh, succeed. And these revenue streams extend beyond simple donations. And so they're selling things. And you know, so I wonder if the way nonprofits have had to move to be more, uh, I guess I don't want to use this term, but uh, Phil Buchanan will be after me if I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, business-like. I wonder if that has driven some of our lack of understanding of who is a nonprofit and what it actually does. I don't know, but. Yeah, I think that that's true. Yeah. Because colleges, hospitals, museums, all of those kinds of things have developed very strong capabilities in earning revenue. And that's what we want them to do is to be diversified so that they can be sustainable and continue to serve us. But unfortunately, sometimes that doesn't get seen as being incredibly charitable. I think some of this also is a result of wealth inequality. Certainly the big donations that the wealthy make have made up for the contributions that were lost from middle-class Americans. But People who are very wealthy give to different causes. They give to the causes that serve them. So they think about adding school at a college to go solve cancer or do something like that, which we count on them to do. That's wonderful. But that's not providing a local community service. And so I think that split between the haves and the have-nots is also causing both the trust problems and perhaps some of the awareness issues you were talking about. Yeah. Stacy, you have shifted from a for-profit entity to a nonprofit entity. You don't see that very often. What was behind that and and how did it go? How's it going now? Yeah, it's a really exciting move for us. Um, one of the things we love is that now we are actually walking in the shoes of our readers. I know a lot more now than I ever did about what it's like to be a chief executive of a nonprofit. And I knew it was hard, but I have learned even more so what the challenges of our audience is and also the tremendous opportunities. And that's what excited us was to say, we've always been a publication that served the sector. Uh, professionals rely on us and we want to continue that. And we want to do much better in that because we know we need to expand. There's such a lack of information and isolation among nonprofits. So we provide both news and professional development. We provide commons for people to debate ideas. You may have seen some of the debate over pluralism that has been in our pages over the last few weeks after a number of foundation leaders decided that they wanted to encourage a greater focus on civility and better conversation. And that cause tremendous debate. We will be publishing yet more pieces and letters to the editor about that. Those are our important roles to do. But what we also wanted to do was to say the news media does need to pay more attention to nonprofits. And that's really important to the sake of democracy. If more people are not involved in nonprofits, not aware, not involved in the kinds of civic causes, then we all suffer. And so that's the part that made us say, that's a charitable mission. That's not as much the realm of what a for-profit does. And so as we've expanded into that, we decided that nonprofit status would make more sense for us. We still have very strong earned revenue. So we were just talking about the colleges and the hospitals. We care deeply about that. And we believe that to be sustainable, you have to do that. But there are other things that philanthropy should support. And so now we have the ability to attract donations as well. Well, I hope someone is supporting this Associated Press partnership that you have. The Lilly Endowment has very generously supported that. And that's just been crucial because of the addition of the number of reporters and editors who are working together to spread coverage. So we are deeply appreciative of that. So let's talk about the conversation, which is a group that I have the pleasure of being a part of because of your invitation. 
And it's it's quite a group of people that you've organized. And we just sort of get together and we throw out ideas for stories. And you look up and lo and behold, there's a story on that. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So is it going the way you intended? Tell us, tell the audience a little bit more about uh, how it came about and what your thoughts were. Uh, to, what are your objectives? <laughs> when we developed this partnership with the Associated Press and with an organization that's called The Conversation, which is a fabulous group that works with scholars to be able to make their ideas accessible to the public, we decided that one of the things we needed was a strong advisory committee to help us better understand how to cover the field, what are some of the key topics, and make sure that we were as well-rounded in our perspectives as possible. One of the challenges in the nonprofit world is sometimes liberals and conservatives don't feel like they have a space to talk together. And so one of the things we did was we made sure that we got people of different ideologies as well as different skills. We have scholars, we have nonprofit executives, and we are lucky to get all of them in a Zoom room every couple months to talk about what are some of the key issues and key things we should be covering. And it has added to our ability to produce stories. There was one meeting in which I think the he- Jan Masoko, so you may know, head of the California Association of Nonprofits, said, there's legislation passing in California right now that you all need to pay attention to. So one of the reporters raced out of the Zoom room and went to go cover it, and we had a news story, and we wouldn't have known that without her help. So we really rely on our advisors for those big picture stories, but sometimes it helps with those things that we need to cover in the moment as well. Yeah. And you mentioned a diverse group too, because you may not know, but but Les Lankowski and I are both members of the Conversation Advisory Group. I did not know that. And Les, by the way, was a Franklin Marshall College graduate, as was I. Oh, so times. you have that connection. And more so, we were both given an honorary doctor of whatever it was. For me, it was honorary doctor of laws from Franklin Marshall in 2001. And he was also given an honorary doctor the same day. So at the same time, that is a special connection. That's a special (laughs) connection. So, and and we have very different views on things as well. So it's, it's quite remarkable. I'm so glad that we can get diverse people together. I think this is, this is one of the challenges that I see in our society and is sometimes reflected in the media that we don't hold open opportunities for all points of view. What's your thought about the role of the chronicle in making sure that we do that. That is that is absolutely one of our missions. Philanthropy tends to lean progressive. And one of the things that we are trying to do is make sure that there's room for many other ideas and discussions and that people really can learn more from one another. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, what's happened in society is we've gotten to the point where some people will not listen to another point of view. I've had people cancel their subscriptions because they don't like that we wrote about a person or a nonprofit that is espousing a view that they don't share. And I appreciate that it angers them and that I hope they will debate and discuss it. But this idea that they want to not read anything about the organizations that they disagree with seems silly. And, you know, we cover these things with the idea that everybody should learn from one another. You should want to know what a group that maybe you oppose is actually doing. What's their strategy? What's their funding? What are they thinking about? What are their ambitions? We shouldn't just be talking to the people we know. We're all able to do that. We need to learn from one another. So we see that as an absolutely crucial part of what we need to do. We've just added another editor to our opinion section. So now we'll have two people working full time to attract more views. We'll have more debates and try to get that moving. I hope we'll also be able to do more live discussions on some of these issues and perhaps one day even live live and do some in-person kinds of things to get more people talking to one another. Yeah, I really feel that that's essential. I um, joined the board of an organization called Convergence Policy. And Convergence is all about making sure that people of very different points of view get together and talk about the issues, uh, particular issues that they may have had some interaction with. And for a long time, they don't even talk about the issue. This is a long conversation they have over 18 months, two years. And by the time they get to really talking about the issue, they know each other. They've built trust. And it's not so difficult as it might have been if they came right out of the box talking about it. And I hope that through your work, Stacey, with the Chronicle, that there's a pathway for us to get to know each other 
and feel less that we're enemies just because we have, you know, differing points of views on things, because unless, until we can get to that point, we really can't solve some of the key problems like diversity, equity, inclusion, you know. Yeah. And it is what nonprofits and foundations should be doing. It feels like that is especially our role to do that in society. So we are very committed to that. And I would urge any of your listeners who have ideas for how we can do that. Um, we're in the early stages of shaping what we plan to do. We will definitely hold some sessions to listen and hear ideas from people, but I welcome them anytime. Yeah. Well, Stacy, I know we're running short on time. You've committed to to doing just a, a, a taste of this today. and But I want to ask you one last question before you head off. And that is, what, what do you see, you know, you and I have been doing this for a while. You know, at some point we're going to hang it up and maybe move off to do something else. What do you think is the future of the nonprofit sector and what is your hope for the nonprofit sector, I should say? Such a small little question to end with. Yeah, you know, (laughs) you know, as as we get older, we get to think about this, the legacy, you know, what what should what should be, you know, the legacy that you've left maybe with the Chronicle, for instance? Well, what's really exciting is to watch what, especially Generation Z and their interest in activism and doing so many things. So when you've got people who are motivated to change the world and to make a difference, and you've got the transfer of wealth coming and we're really seeing the signs of it. So potentially a lot of resources could flow into the nonprofit world if we all act to explain what we're doing, show that we can do it well. So I think the potential is really strong, but we're going to have to keep people motivated to stay with it. And so it would be a terrible thing to lose the excitement of young people coming into the field. I have been delighted to see the number of journalists who are younger, who are interested in covering this field. Report for America is a tremendous organization that deploys people to do some of this kind of work. So I think if we can keep some of those kinds of things going, the world will be much stronger. So I'm very optimistic, even though the pace of change in this world is often very slow. And so sometimes it can be frustrating, but I think the future is something that we are all a lot in control of, and it can be bright if we just take the right actions. Well, Stacy, thank you for that. We'll leave it right there. I want to thank you for joining me today, and I wish you continued success with the transformation that you're going through at the Chronicle. And I hope that you're able to achieve all of the goals that you want with that. And to all of our listeners, you've been listening to Stacy Palmer, who is the chief executive at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, a nonprofit. And you've heard, obviously, all of the great work she's done and is doing there at the Chronicle. And for those of you who are listening for the first time, this is a weekly podcast, so feel free to check us out every week. You can subscribe to the show. We really appreciate that. And if you want to make a donation, you can do that also by going to give.org, and we will use that money very wisely, I assure you. Thank you all for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.